Hello, fellow explorers. Welcome to an episode of How to Start Your Career In. We are going to learn about the oil and gas industry, and we're going to learn what it takes to be an offshore field engineer. I have with me Raji, and she is calling in from Malaysia. Like, I am so honored that you are participating in this and giving me your time right now. You are you were a student who graduated two years ago and you're entering this brand new industry. So you've got a really unique perspective that you can share with us and with other students who are either just entering college or just graduating from college. I'm really excited to hear your insight. So without further ado, Raji, first of all, how are you today, this morning slash evening? Well, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm doing fantastic. It's really nice to have you. I mean, thank you so much for having me. It's a Monday morning here in Malaysia. Not too bad. Um, I'm headed offshore tomorrow, actually. So that's just, exciting. Yeah, just mentally preparing myself for the um, possible seasickness that's to come. So that's just me. <laughs> yeah, not too bad. How are things with you? They're fantastic. Can you tell us about the oil and gas industry. Just give us a, a bird's eye view of what the industry is all about. Now, when we speak about oil and gas industry, now I can go on hours, but um, <laughs> I, think, I think what makes oil and gas um, industry unique by itself is because of its huge spectrum of business itself. So, um, you know, while it being uh, pretty known for um, it being a very volatile industry, um, it is still one of, a, or one of the largest sector in the world that um, you know generates trillions of revenue annually, and I think that what makes it very crucial for um, it being one of the, um, I think uh, what makes it a huge um, look into the economic sector as well it, itself. So other than that, when we look into oil and gas industry, um, there are essentially three segments. Uh, we have the uh, when we look into oil and gas. I'm sorry. When we look into the oil and gas industry, there's essentially three segments that we look into. So we've got the upstream business, we've got the uh, midstream, as well as the downstream business. So now, okay. when we speak about the upstream business, it is essentially the exploration and production. So that's your, this is where um, it all starts. And then we have the midstream. It's just pretty much um, transportation and storage of these crude oils. And then these are usually sent. Um, to refineries uh, to process them to goods. And last but not least, of course, we have the downstream business. It's just pretty much um, refineries that sort of uh, refines these um, raw materials to goods, such as um, gasoline, fuel, or in fact, our cooking oil. So this is just pretty much what the industry and the businesses that we have. But uh, how does oil and gas generally work is that, so we have the um, ENP team, so we have the exploration and production, or rather we can call the operators who essentially owns the asset. They operate and owns the assets, but this um, ENP companies don't usually drill these wells. So what happens is that this um, ENP companies, or rather I would say operators, for example, like Petronas from Malaysia, we have ExxonMobil or Shell. Um, these are the few names that we can uh, name for operators. So what they do is that they hire contract drilling companies to drill wells for them. And so now once these wells are drilled, what happens is that they'll have to sort of um, generate and sustain this production along the time. So this is when they hire the oil and gas servicing companies because well servicing services is required to, to sort of sustain the asset throughout. So when we speak about career opportunities, like um, students can actually get themselves into either working with an operator or the drilling companies, or as well as the um, oil and gas servicing company. So that is where I am attached to it. I'm with the oil and gas servicing company. So I think when we speak about the oil and gas industry, the um, field of opportunities is just so huge. You can either work with the operators, um, oil and gas servicing companies, or even the drilling company. So it all depends on what you want to do um, as an engineer yourself that wants to pursue in the um, offshore industry or oil and gas industry. So, But then again, it all depends on where you're from as well. So for example, in Malaysia, we don't have much of um, operators. So however, uh, we do have more oil and gas services company. So you can look, when you do your research, when you wanna get yourself into the oil and gas industry, it's always good for you to know uh, where you're seeking to it. So penetrating into the oil and gas industry is great enough. So it doesn't matter whether you wanna get yourself into an operator company or you know any uh, services company. It all comes down to what do you want to do and is just penetrating into the industry first and gaining the experience. So I think uh, when it comes to opportunities in the industry itself, 
there's just a vast um, a, a field of opportunities there is actually. So yeah. you are an offshore field engineer. What you mentioned three sector, like three sections of the oil and gas industry, the business section, the upstream, and then the downstream. Where does an offshore field engineer fit into all of that? And what are some of the tasks that you need to do? No, that, that's a very good question. See, um, so I mentioned this upstream, midstream, and downstream businesses. So when we speak about offshore, it's mm -hmm. solely upstream business. So upstream business is where basically offshore um, exploration to production. So when we speak about upstream business and looking specifically into um, exploration and production, they are one by itself. So they are even huge. Like when you look into, like if you were to draw a tree and you're just gonna branch it out, it's just gonna go further and further. So when you, you know, sort of zoom into upstream business, that is where uh, you look into the um, basically offshore. So whatever in the middle of the sea, that's just upstream, that's just for understanding. Downstream is basically whatever on the land, like uh, petrochemical plants and et cetera. So I fall under the upstream business, but, uh -huh. um, but not all well services companies solely only focus on um, upstream business actually so some companies do look into downstream and midstream so it all depends on your services as well quick question is down is when you talk about like downstream i just want to make sure i understand correctly is that like getting from the gas company to the consumer and it's upstream more like getting it from our natural resources to the production level to to you know process it to get it ready for the downstream yep yep you got you got you sort of got that right actually so so the, okay. so in a very simple term you get the crude oil from the res reservoir right from the seabed right mm -hmm. you get them from under the sea right and then you transport that so midstream is basically transportation so it should be a um a pipelines etc and then you send it over to the downstream to refine these um crude oil because when you gain this crude oil they're all of different um level of uh, materials actually so you have to actually refine what's good what's bad what's required and according to its boiling points and etc so that's where all the processing happens downstream um, mm -hmm. to to switch these raw materials to goods. That's just pretty much it. So, gotcha. when we look into, so when we look into upstream business, it's solely exploration and production. So now what? Now let's just you know uh, zoom into exploration and production. So I fall under uh, sort of these um, well servicing that for that goes under maintenance. I would say um, after a while production is going on, but before production happens, when you drill a well, that's when. Or before you even drill a well, that's when you explore. So you explore, look for potential um, uh, zones where there are. Uh, that's crude oils, I would say, and then you just say that, oh, okay, there's, there's a place here that, you know, there's potentially oil, that's when you drill the well, and it's still not a bingo, I would say, until, um, you know, you get the production out. So even in fact, like when you do your seismic study, so this is where geologists come in. So as a geologist, mm -hmm. um, or a, if you're a geologist, then you would sort of go into the exploration where you look for potential zones to, you know, re reservoirs that are producing, but that will still not tell you that it's going to be 100% successful until you actually um, get the crude oils from. So once the well is actually producing, that is when everything starts. So now, once these wells are producing crude oil, it's very, very uh, crucial to maintain, to sort of sustain this, because mm -hmm. um, there's going to be so much of challenges that comes when you actually get something from our nature source, right? There's going to be a lot of other things like, it's not just about, um, you know, drilling a hole and just, okay, let's just flow it out. You know, it's there's so, right. much, there's so much of pressure that works along. There's a lot of things. That is why it's, that is why when it comes to engineering work, especially upstream, there's just so many people involved, so many sort of technical um, um, professionals or interest that comes in to work together with, with the same goal of, yeah, just sort of getting a you know, quality product. Qu sorry, quick question. Uh, so there's so many different teams. So, so we're zooming in from oil and gas to the upstream part of that industry and zooming into offshore specifically, there are so many teams that are involved are there different types of offshore field engineers? Are there different types of engineering teams? How does that work? How does that work? All right, so um, let's just uh, define field engineer first. Now, yes. field engineer by definition is just pretty much someone who works on site more than um, you see yourself in an office setting. All right, that's just pretty much what a field engineer is. Now, when we say offshore field engineer, it's just pretty much someone or an engineer 
who goes offshore to perform a job. All right. Mm -hmm. Now, what do I mean by job? Like we are all working now. When I first got into the industry, I never understood what job actually means. Like I it, it, now every project that we go for, we sort of call it a job. All right. So when we speak, see, when I mentioned that, you know, to sustain a well, we need well servicing activities. Now, mm -hmm. so some of the examples of well servicing activities are like um, it can start off with cementing, casing, uh, perforating. Now, these are all the terms that are. Uh, that's just pretty much oil and gas glossary. Like you, you can just Google them up. Now, I'll give an example, like uh, for example, uh, perforation. Now what is perforation? This is something that's required for you to, this sort of like uh, put a tool in. Now I'm gonna try to use a pretty very basic layman term. You put a tool in and then you're gonna shoot um, at a certain zone that you there's potential for oil of crude oil or gas, you know? So you're gonna shoot and that is where the oils or gas will actually flow and give us a product right like oil so this is just one part of it now we have got so many more and one of the one of it is the maintenance which is usually done in the production facilities now what do i mean production facilities like this is where once you get all of these is just to um for this you see when you get them from the seabed you've mm -hmm. got to send them to the downstream now to send that over you've got so much a process that goes on so along the way um, there are other challenges like one of my one, one of what we focus on is um sand challenges so this is something that my company does the flow assurance did you say sand, sand challenges sand yes sand production is oh. actually one of the biggest challenge in the oil and gas industry now why is sand a problem is because yeah they can cause due to friction they can actually cause erosion to pipelines and when this happens mm. it actually could yeah. potentially damage um you know uh downhole tools uh, we've got um it can even go up to damaging the facilities itself and when this damages assets it's going to it's going to cost so much to uh uh to maintain these things so you know to to service all these items so this is something that we not do not want so to mitigate challenges like this this is where well servicing companies come in to sort of um you know work a way through to sustaining the asset throughout so yeah. it sounds like there's like a lot of maintenance involved in all of the parts like to get it to get the crude oil out of the ground, there's a ton of technology involved. I say a ton, like I, as if I have any idea what numeric value gets put on that. There, there's it, certain technologies that are used to, to get the crude oil out um, and then to transport it to the production facilities. So as, as an offshore field engineer, like specifically your job, can you take us through um, a typical project? And I say project because I don't like to ask, what's a typical day in the life of you? Because every day could be different. So I'd like to hear about what a project is like for you as an offshore field engineer. All right. Now, um, so like I mentioned. Um, just oh, and just real quick. And you can start with the fact that like you're going offshore tomorrow. So like from here, I think it's such a great way to start. Like, okay, you're gonna be on a boat tomorrow. Okay, I okay. hope you get seasick. So what's, what's a project like starting from going out to sea? Okay, for me, yeah. So I'm gonna specifically yes. focus on what I do. So now as yeah. a field engineer, you can, be, you can be doing so many things. Now as one myself, well, I'll be headed offshore tomorrow. I'll be headed offshore tomorrow. Um, mode of transportation is actually via sea, so I'm going to get my seasickness. Now, once we reach there, what happens is that it's just basically day one mobilization. Now, how work usually starts is that before you start a job, you'll have to um, apply for permit, work permits, and then uh, start your job the next day. There's a toolbox meeting in the morning. so. Uh, you wake up about five in the morning, get your breakfast in, and um, your days usually, so you, your, your um, work hours are usually 12 hours, so six to six, um, pretty long hours, and the most that you can extend is four hours. So the most that you would work is 16 hours. So I've had experience working 16 hours, um, haven't really had a chance to work night shift, uh, but I've all, all done uh, day shifts. Um, I'm sorry, I think, yeah. So, uh, I've, I've, so, so this is pretty much how work is. You, you, you work every day, no weekends, no public holidays. You're, when you're offshore, you work every day. Um, 
until you come back. So this time around, it's just going to be a week for me. And also, I think what makes this trip very interesting is that this is my third offshore trip, uh, but also my very first time uh, working off, uh, going alone actually for this assignment. And I think this is, I think this would be covered later in one of the skills that you have to adapt is just pretty much to be able to, you know, you be, to be able to sort of work with no supervision. Now you're going to have operations on sites like mm -hmm. wraps on site that's going to be there for you. But when you represent your company, then there's going to be decision making that you have to do on your own. So when you're offshore, connection is going to be a problem. And so there's a lot of things that is going to come into place. Um, it's not going to be like here where, you know, you've got right. your connections are easily accessible. You can just reach out to people there. It's going to be a bit, a bit tricky. Um, and this time around, it's going to be pretty challenging because my my first time alone, my first two trip, um, I went with my senior uh, colleagues. They are very experienced. So I think that's amazing to start off my career offshore with mm -hmm. someone that's so well versed with the industry. So they sort of like taught me through it. Uh, so that's amazing. Uh, so I'm actually looking forward for this one because it's yeah, going to be so for this work. one. For this one, what's the, so I use this background. I think I just typed offshore rig. Off, yeah, I think I just, I typed offshore oil rig to get the photo in the background from Canva. And I'm wondering, what is this called? Is this a platform that's this background right here? Now, now see, um, a rig and a platform is two different things. Um, oh. A rig is usually mobile, yeah. So a rig is before <laughs> a, production uh, a production platform is built. Rigs are usually, uh, I would say, temporary um builds that are essentially that moves around to sort of look for wells and just to drill wells. So once these okay. are built, So a rig is more temporary, a platform is more permanent. Correct. Permanent a rig is more like if you're part of the exploration phase yep. and a platform drilling. is more like you're doing the midstream? Production. The production. Pro yep. Production. Gotcha. production so, to once, so once you get to your, are you going to a rig or a platform? platform okay so once you get to your platform what like what are you what are you there to do are you there to like are you doing inspections um are you like are you are you inspecting things and then making work orders for other crews to do what is it what is it that your responsibilities are once you get to your platform Right. So as a field engineer, um, you go offshore to perform the task. Now, you could be uh, the work leader if you're bringing a team. But mm -hmm. in my case, um, especially my my um, company, it's usually our job is just usually one man or by max two man jobs. It can be done just by one or two. So there's no much of supervision that we do, uh, especially as a field engineer myself. We sort of do the work. Um, I'm not a supervisor or anything, but of course, if you're a supervisor, then you sort of um, delegate the task, you'll be someone supervising it, but that's a different thing to look into. But as a field engineer myself, I go offshore to perform my job. Now, when you ask me, what do I do exactly is that, again, it depends on the sort of services that I'm going for. So as a servicing company, you mm -hmm. um, see, that's what I think makes it different than which company, it depends on the company you're doing. Now, when you're into an oil and gas servicing company, it means that you're, uh, sort of an expert in a specific area of services like my company we are focused or very much well focused in sand management and flow assurance so now when we speak about sand management and flow assurance there's so many technologies that we can use to sort of monitor sand so my company we have several ways to uh, work towards that and one of which I've, I've been doing is the first two times that I went offshore was sand sampling so that's one example now this mm -hmm. time around that I'm going for, it's something totally different. I'm going for, though it's related to flow assurance and sand management, but the service that I'm gonna do for is just a calibration. So now these two things is different because the first time when I went offshore for sand sampling, I sort of have to uh, work with a unit um, on a production deck um, right with a production uh, pipeline that's flowing where, you know, I do the real thing kind of thing and then getting, getting in the sample. So sort of like getting on site and working. However, and um, is this, is it called sign sample? San. Sang. San. Oh my gosh. That's okay. Sorry. I just, I wasn't sure. I, I was, I wasn't hearing it correctly. My bad. Right. Right, sand. Okay. Right, so we sample for sands. Now, uh, yeah, that's another whole story we want to talk about. So that, that, that's an, an example. Um, whether you're going in for installation or, like, for example, this one that I'm going for is just for calibration. Now, calibration is just 
going into wait sorry let's go back to the sand sample just really quick because when you do that what are you testing it for what are you testing the sands for or, or what is the sample for right so see i mentioned that sand um, production is um a huge challenge uh to the production engineers because it sort of brings so much of damage so it's something that you do not want now right. So when it, when it is a challenge, um, it is also understandable. It's pretty common that um, oil and gas industrial operators usually will have um, sand control measures that's already been in place from the downhole system itself. However, when it comes to control measures, there's only so much that you can control. So it's always good for you to have various control measures. So when it mm -hmm. comes to, you know, you've got like sand screens that can, you know, sort of filter sand out so you don't get sands up to the well bore, right? right? However, there could potentially come a time where your sand screen goes um, off, like it's not functioning well because in time it's just gonna, you know, lose its efficiency. So there's gonna be potential for sand to come up to the well bore. Now, when it comes up to the well bore, so now there's potential for challenge to happen as well, right? So there's gonna be descenders um, on the production facility. So even though we do have sand screens, there's still descenders up in the production facility to ensure mm -hmm. that sand is accumulated and it doesn't go off to the flow line. So even if it goes up to the production facility, we can still stop it there so it doesn't further ruin the uh, the flow line right now yeah this sample so this so now how do you ensure that your descender is working so this is where we come in we come okay. in to, so this is where my company comes in we fix um uh, sort of our services like our technology to ensure that the descender is working so one of the example like you said why do we um sample for sand is um it's actually i would say uh, there's two there's two ways to say it one is uh, either just to see that uh what does it consist of like what is the sand if whether it can it's uh it's good or bad or there's just just just, just analyze them or another mm -hmm. way is just to um you know verify the efficiency of the descender now if the descender is working i must make sure that whatever that comes after the descender i should not I must ensure that there's no sand at all because if the descender is working, then it should be able to accumulate all sands. Now, if I'm right. able to, if I'm able to get sand, then there's something wrong with the descender. So that's just one way to see it. Or it can, so it, it's, um, it sounds it it, it it sounds like it's um, risk management. There are many risk management protocols, and then you guys come in to service one of the technologies that's involved in the whole risk management structure. Um, I'm just painting this picture of, I don't even know what it, I have no idea what a desander looks like, but I'm just painting a picture of something and then you guys going in there and, and testing it and making sure that you've got your samples in this big facility. Um, uh, although I'm sure, I'm sure, are the platforms very big? I mean, it, they, they look like they're about the size of like a, a house or something. Like they're no, not yeah. that big. Now, production platforms are pretty huge, actually. Uh, but then again, it depends on how many wellheads you have. So the more wellheads you have, then you potentially have. Now, wellheads are basically um, uh, where the point where you get the crude oils from. So some mm -hmm. uh, platforms could have a lot of wellheads. Some could just have one or two. So that depends. Right. Uh, my experience, so I've not had much of an experience, and I've only been around the Malaysia Sea. So I'm, I'm pretty sure that overseas, they are even huge, because it depends on how much the uh, platform is producing. So the more it's, it's used, so if it's, I think um, usually platforms are bigger when they're producing more. That's just my understanding. So my first experience offshore, um, so the first client that I went to, the production platform wasn't too big. But the second one, because they were one of the largest gas producing um, um, uh, platform in, uh, in Malaysia, so that was pretty huge. And I think that was just so beautiful. It was really, it was really huge and beautiful. And and I think what, why it's also big is that other than just, you know, all these activities of crude oil that's going on and all these uh, processes that's happening, we also have living quarters. So that is where we stay. So we mm -hmm. need to be able to uh, accommodate um, sort of that, 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 that number of people. So I think that's why platforms are a bit bigger compared to rigs. So if you can just search up, rigs are usually just small structured um, temporary builds, but platforms are pretty huge. So for an offshore field engineer, one of your examples was um, checking the desander technology, um, checking this desander machines and then servicing them. For this trip that you're about to go on, you were, uh, you were going to tell us about that example of, of what this trip is going to entail. So can you right. tell us about that? 
Right. So this time around, it's nothing to do with. I mean, uh, not. I wouldn't say nothing to do with it, but it's just a total different service. So uh, other than sand sampling, we also do um, acoustic sand monitoring. So now, what is that? So this is just pretty much a technology again where it detects or it monitors sand flow in the pipeline. Now, how do you know? Um, or this this just pretty much to see how much of sand that we have in a flow line. So we sort of have a clamton um, detector fixed onto the pipeline. So when the sand is going to produce noise. So through this noise indication is where I'm going to get a reading on a sand PC. Now, what's a PC? It's just a laptop or a computer that, that is in one of the control room where I'm going to monitor, monitor my data. So I'm going to get all sort of graphs that indicates noise. And mm -hmm. how do I get this is through this detector that's fixed in the flow line. So there's this sort of a technology that transmits and gives me that data. Now, what I do is that I interpret this data, these spikes, I interpret these spikes and sort of come with, um, sort of come with a conclusion that uh, whether it's producing sand, there's just so much of solids or now it's just pretty cool. It's just nothing, you know, there's no sand flow line. So it's actually, it's just something that you interpret. So what I'm going for today is now, once you've actually installed these things offshore, you've got to calibrate them. You've got to sort of uh, do yearly maintenance. So I'm just going mm -hmm. in to calibrate them just to get them working, if that's a way to put. So just, just calibration, uh, putting in some data and just ensuring that the system is working fine. We should be having maintenance coming up somewhere next year as well. So this is what I'm going for. Just a few days trip, actually. So when it comes to offshore as well, it's just um, it could be maximum of a month, 28 days. Or in fact, some days it's going to be a three days trip and then you come back. Yeah. So we've talked a lot about sand like I never would have thought that sand was such a huge part of this whole process and it makes sense because it it degrades the the pipes so as an offshore field engineer one do you have to go to college do you have to have a college degree and then two what degrees what majors do you recommend people get now um to be an engineer I would say yes, a college degree would be, uh, you, you'll definitely need an engineering degree um, to, uh -huh. to, to be an engineer offshore, but if you will wanna work offshore, it does not necessarily mean that you need an engineering degree. What I mean, to be an engineer, you oh, need an okay. engineering degree, but not only engineers work offshore. You see, you can even be- You could be a technician. Exactly, you can be a technician. So you don't you don't need a, a, an engineering degree. You can just you know get certificates of uh, you know practical certificates uh, just to ensure that gets you offshore. So then okay. again, so it, so it depends what you want to do. And other than that, we even have chefs. So if you're a cook that you know wants to just have an experience to work in the middle of the sea, you'll just need, you don't need an engineering degree to be a chef, right? So this is so mm -hmm. much of a uh, thing that. Uh, that's just the uh, offshore, but as a field engineer, then having a degree would, uh, is, is, is important. Yes, you'll need an engineering degree, uh, but what engineering degree to be specific, it can be anything. It doesn't necessarily mean that you need a petroleum engineering degree to work offshore, no such thing. Like myself, I'm a chemical engineering student, hmm. and I'm offshore. You can even be of a background of mechanical engineering, electrical, even in fact, um, you know, aviation or any engineering degree, because when it comes to working offshore, uh, it's more towards the skills that you acquire through the experience as well, that you bring, um, it's not so much of an academic thing that you'll have to bring forward to, though of course it's gonna help. Like for example, the difference it's gonna make is that as a petroleum engineer and a chemical engineer myself, we can both work offshore, but as a petroleum engineer, your knowledge is just already there. So it's gonna take an extra homework for me to do, to gain sort of the oil and gas terms. That's just that's just it, but there's no specific engineering degree that you need. You can be any engineer working offshore. And what are some of the essential skills that you have to have as an offshore engineer? Right, I think I think this is something uh, that's really um, uh, to, to point out, to look into, to get ourselves prepared for, um, to get ourselves offshore. Now, to get yourself into the corporate world, of course, there's so many um, skills that you can acquire. There's technical, there's just soft skills that you can get. But you see, when it comes to technical skills, I always believe that this is something that you can acquire along the way, depending on mm. what you do. So when it comes to experience in working, uh, technical skill is just something that you grow in time. So there's no problem with that usually. So when you're working, just say as a field engineer in a company, then the company is gonna 
really um, equip you with the knowledge that you need um, to ensure that you're credible to perform a job, job. So technical skill is not a problem, but I think my concern would come to soft skills because this is where a lot of students especially sort of neglect or don't look into it at all because for them mm -hmm. when you're studying, it's all about academic and you know, academic excellence is just books and whatever that you produce at the end of the day. So it's mm -hmm. just producing, you know, aces, but they don't look into what you actually need in the corporate world. I think one of the essential skills that I would say to name a few actually is first things first. Um... Oh, I think we're having some issues, some internet issues, right when she said first things first, hopefully we get her back. But, you know, I want to touch on something that she talked about prior to us going live, um, Raji said that when she was a student, she said there was only so much that she could learn as a university student and that she actually learned a lot on the job. So, you know, I, I wanted to comment on her point that even though you're a student in college, if you're going for whatever engineering degree you want to go for, you don't have to know everything. You don't have to learn everything in four years. You don't have to learn everything in even five years if you, some of you guys end up being super seniors. Um, uh, unfortunately, we just lost Raje. Hopefully she gets uh, Wi-Fi and is able to come back to us soon. But again, students, you don't have to learn everything while you're at university. And to Raje's point, you can learn on the job. Once you're in the industry and you're actually working, there's a whole lot more to learn. And so with soft skills, it's important to be humble. It's important to have humility. It's important to say, uh, sometimes it's important to say nothing at all. Sometimes it's important to just listen to what other people have to say because they're very experienced and you know they have, ins they have an insight to share with you. So, I've, I've said in a, um, one of my live streams that if you listen to what other people have to say, once you get started in your industry, say you learn from five different people, okay, you're going to learn five different ways, but you get to choose which of those five ways, which of those five methods for completing a task is the best way because you get to try five different things and maybe you maybe you're able to come up with a sixth way to get a task done and that ends up being the most efficient way so again it's important to learn from others it's important to learn on the job it's important to develop those soft skills and we have Raje back i'm so happy that i was able to um talk <laughs> i was uh, i mentioned to our viewers that it, when you and i were speaking prior to coming live um, as a university student, there was only so much that you could learn in the academic setting. So, uh, and, and I think that's where you are going with that is, is it's important to learn on the job and it's important to develop those communication soft skills, um, for technical skills. What are some of the technical skills that you developed while on the, actually, I'm going to rephrase my question while you were on the job, because you learned more once you got into your industry. What is an example of either a technical skill or soft skill that you learned on the job that you didn't learn while in university? Now, um, technical would be honestly on the job task itself. Uh, whatever that I perform right now, it's not something that I learned. I'm getting an echo, sorry. I'm sorry. Um, so I think acquiring the tr the the technical skill is just everything um, on the job actually. Because as a chemical engineer myself, um, whatever that I studied is totally different than what I am performing on the day to day task actually. So whatever that I do offshore is I think starting off with the mechanical things itself. Um, you know, working on a mechanical focused task itself is something that I'll have to acquire on the job. So that was something that I had to learn from scratch just pretty much how to use equipment, the tools itself. Um, other than that, instrumentation um, knowledge, um, electrical knowledge that I had to learn to pick it up because of the service that I do. So it all depends on um, the uh, sort of 
service that you're into. So that was all different for me because coming from a chemical engineering degree background, what I studied and what I'm doing right now, though there's a little bit of correlation, but there's just a lot of other technical skills that I had to acquire along the way. Now, soft skills, besides communication, I think what I learned was critical thinking. Now, now you see, troubleshoot, you see, um, you can, it's not always going to be um, fixing a problem. Sometimes you'll have to first identify what the problem is. It's not always so that you, so that require a level of understanding for it. So you'll have to sort of um, be capable to think out of the box to first identify what a problem is and then troubleshoot them. So mm -hmm. acquiring critical thinking is also vital when it comes to on the day to day, especially offshore. There are going to be so many things that comes up um, that you, you you have not even anticipated. Like it's not always going to be because I think every day is different, especially offshore. So you go with an expectation, but every day there's going to be a lot of other thing. Um, other than that, adapting to situations, especially offshore, uh, being a female engineer, going offshore just with a load of just men on board that's just something that you have to get yourself prepared for um and i think adapting to, to situations like that where sometimes you will even be looked as like i think the most that i got was when they look at me they go like hey that's heavy uh, do you need help now now i think what um you know you've got to have this sort of self-confidence that you have to instill in yourself to ensure that you know though i think steer typically uh, female are often deemed as weak, but um, it's also something that we have to understand that when we get ourselves onto jobs like this that are very challenging, uh, you have to first also prove yourself that you're capable. Mm -hmm. Now, because because um, I think it's not wrong for people to think that you're weak, but it's how you show yourself out there. So that's also something adapting to situations and how you react to situations. So this is uh, some things that you sort of learn along the way as you work in the corporate world. Because when you're in school, all you learn is books and just pretty much getting your ex academic uh, aces. And this is pretty much it. But when it comes to working, there's a lot of other things from speaking to clients, ensuring they understand, delivering notes that are, you know, uh, ensuring that every point that you speak is something that's true and right, um, delivering, delivering it on point, thinking out of the box um, that's going to sometimes even acquire on the spot thinking and also at the same time ensuring that it's correct. You can just simply say anything that's not right offshore, especially because things can go real wrong. And other than that, adapting to climate changes, um, just situations, I would say, because offshore life is something of its own. Um, it's very different than how is it on land. If you ask me, the weather could get really bad. Sea seasickness is something to be prepared for. There's just something that I didn't anticipate, honestly. I thought seasickness is nothing. When I got onto the, sh I mean, when I got offshore, and that's when it hit me that there's just something a lot more than that. Now, I always pictured offshore like something so cool, but I think that's just what we see from what Google shows us. But mm -hmm. when we get ourselves there, it's just so much more, the challenges that comes with the work. So there's so much of soft skills, I would say, because these are skills that you acquire as you experience life. So this is something that you have to be open to um, oh, learning. Yeah. It's just something you have to be open to learning as you grow. So not just to stay, you know, stick to your principles, just something, you know, just to be free and learn. That's just pretty much it. To, be, to have an attitude of learning throughout your journey, actually. So um, I'm just going to mute your mic for just a moment so that we don't get any echo. I'm not sure about these sound issues, but I love a couple of things that you just said. One, speaking confidently, having this self-confidence is very important because if you are going to present something and you do it without confidence, people aren't going to want to take you seriously. And I think that's great advice for males and females. Um, and... Um, gosh, you just hit on like another, another insight that I really enjoyed is that uh, the, the, the skills that you develop, you develop out in the field, you develop with life experience. And that's something that you maybe can only uh, get a limited amount of while you're in university because, and it's not that you're not living life while you're in university. It's just that you are kind of you're you're within the the safety and within the bubble of the university but it's it's a whole other thing to experience the job once you're out there and especially offshore um 
you know, and, and it's, it's, it's a little comforting to hear that you experience seasickness, but you're still doing this. And, and I think that there's just this element of toughness that you have about you, but there's also this incredible grace that you have and, and this incredible professional way that you present yourself that I, I just really enjoy. So all good insight. Can you, t can we take it back to cert certificates and certifications? Cause you mentioned that you don't have to be an engineer to do offshore type work. Um, and you mentioned that there were certain certifications that you should attain. So what are those certifications? Whether you are an engineer or not, what do you need in order to work offshore? Now, to get yourself offshore, the first things first is that you'll have to uh, be fit to work offshore. So you'll have to get your medical assessment in and uh, you'll have to be uh, reported fit from the doctor themselves. So first things first is, you know, to be medically fit. So medical assessment is the first thing that you need. Now, other than, so once you're now fit to work, you'll have to undergo a um, sea survival training. So you can mm. search up, it, 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 it's actually called BOSIA. It's a basic offshore induction training. It's a sea survival training where they train you to sort of survive if emergency happens offshore. So what are the sort of um, safety measures and things that you have to be prepared for offshore if, say, emergency comes in place? So that is a training that you have to go for. And I'm telling you, my experience um, from what I expected and how it was real life, oh, it was very challenging, honestly. So to actually get through it and if you're capable of getting certified, then it's a pretty big deal, I would say. So once you get that certified, I would say additional trainings, which is that required to get you offshore would be just depending on your company. So for example, myself, if I were to perform a task, I'll have to be, a uh, company should ensure that I am uh, competent to perform the task. So these are additional trainings. And this depends on the task that you're doing. But the first two that's very important is to be medically fit and to uh, attain your uh, safety sea survival uh, cert that is actually valid for four years. Um, so you renew them every four years. So now I've got mine that, that, that would expire like perhaps in another two years. So once that's done, I'll go for a refresher course. So this is just something that you'll be doing as well as your medical uh, assessment. It has a validity of two years depending on your level of fitness. So sometimes if you're not so fit, uh, but still capable of going offshore, you do get your one year um, uh, a report actually. So you renew them every one year. So these are the two things that you need to get yourself offshore. Sure. Is sea survival training scary? Um, well, it's done in a pool and it's not scary, but there's one part where they will sort of uh, uh, picture a, a helicopter landing and crashing. So now when it crashes, it goes under the sea. So now how they do it is that this uh, sort of uh, helicopter looking or chopper looking build and you'll have to sit in and you have to buckle yourself in right so you buckle up and now i think it's pretty um yeah nerve-wracking because you go under the pool cautiously this time you see you know that it's going in and you're just buckled up and sitting in and uh what happens is that it goes in and then you'll just they'll teach you how to buckle it off and then you'll you'll sort of um get yourself an escape through the window so there's sort of like a window that's there and then you go off now that is okay because you go in the water you just sort of uh, they'll give you you can either hold your breath or they'll have a breathing um equipment that you can use so it depends you know if you can use that now that's one but i think the scary part is that that's one of the uh um i think one of the is that it goes in and it rotates uh 360 so you'll be upside down underwater oh my gosh you, yeah and you have to unbuckle yourself and escape through the window and even that there's two two challenges one there's no window so it's just a hole you just escape through so your only sort of focus would be okay i need to get under the, now you're under the water upside down your only focus would be i've got to successfully get this buckle off in time because you're holding your breath take it off and you're already upside down. Now you're taking it off and then you go off. But I think the challenge comes in where it's the same scenario, but this time there's actually a window. So you've got to mm -hmm. also push it through and there's a way to push a window underwater. You can't push it in, in the middle because there's pressure in and out. So you can't open it. So there's actually a way where they'll say you have to sort of tip it at the edge of it. Like there's an edge of it. So you've oh, got okay. to do it like 
then you'll be able to sort of escape. So this is actually a trick or a thing that a tip in life that say that so happen you are stuck in a car and in water for some reason, <laughs> you can't you can't break them if you're just hitting in the middle because there's just pressure everywhere. So you have to know where to tip it. Yeah. So that's that's sort of a a, a, a scenario. Tip, if you're ever underwater in your car, don't tap the middle. Tap the edge of your window. Yeah. Yes. Uh, a well, lot, that's a lot. great like that's forget industry insight that's some great life insight but also try not to get your car underwater <laughs> now um i think a lot of upper body strength is required when it comes to offshore um mm. there's just so many things that they'll share it's a lot of upper body strength because there's so much of swinging that happens as well when you transfer yourself if you wonder how do we transfer ourselves now it depends on countries actually so mm. um in majority of countries because i've spoke to some overseas guys uh, who works offshore they don't really have this much of problem because usually they travel by chopper but in malaysia like for me um though we do have choppers uh, most times we travel by boat and when we get offshore now from the boat we'll have to transfer our stuff to the platform now if you wonder how do we transfer you know personnel from the boat to the platform usually there's like a basket transfer there's so many ways of transferring but one of the common one would be swing rope transfer now i think you'd want to be interested a in that a swing rope like you got to climb up the rope no you actually swing <laughs> to the platform so that's actually a rope attached uh that's a rope and then you you hold on to it and you swing to the platform. Now that's pretty scary actually and requires so much of strength. So, um, so that's, yeah, and, and with the weather, so the boat is not just gonna be there, it's gonna be like that. And then the platform is just here. So the boat goes like this and then you, yeah, this is some, this is one of it, by the way. Yeah, you can just Google up like ways to transfer personnel from um, the boat to the pl platform. There's something interesting, but so much of uh, upper body strength is required. I would say so when I first started so that's something when I first started I was pretty weak uh, but in time you know with my exercises like I sort of knew that okay Raja I need to get my upper body strength up so that's when everything comes in uh, yeah there's just something to look into oh my You've god got to, yeah <laughs> I wonder if that's specific to like Malaysia or if like more countries do that yeah, I, th I think it's pretty common, but when it comes to safety measure, like I think they do look into something that's more safe. Do you guys, when you climb up those ropes, do you use any sort of fall protection? Like, do you clip onto a um, like a self-retracting device or any like anything so that if you let go of the rope, you don't just plop into the water? No, you say that's the thing. You don't let go of the rope. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Well, I learned, wow, well, I learned something new. That's, that is, it sounds fun. Like, I'm not even gonna lie, it sounds super fun. Um, are there any, are there any conferences or trade shows that someone interested in being an offshore field engineer should attend in order to network with others? Oh, oh no. <laughs> oh, we lost her again. Oh, now you're back. It was, it was great because when the screen froze for a moment. It was like you had the biggest and most beautiful smile on your face. It was like, I wish I looked that good when my internet crapped out. But anyway, are there any conferences or trade shows that people interested in being an offshore field engineer should attend to network with other professionals? A lot, actually. A lot of oil and gas, in, a lot of oil and gas uh, conferences that are actually out there. So perhaps for students who wants to get insights or updates or to get just themselves exposed to the industry itself, it's good to actually have uh, experience attending conferences. Um, perhaps I think I would advise students to you know, look themselves into the petroleum industry as a whole, um, get yourself involved in the Society of Petroleum Engineering, uh, just to sort of get yourself into it so that, you know, it can leverage you later during interviews or, you know, when you want to get yourself, because I think employers are seeking someone with um, the enthusiasm to get them um, to work offshore. Like, um, you see, employers know that you don't know anything about, the anything about the job that you're about to perform, but the least you can do is to um, leverage yourself is to um, have an exposure to the industry. So I think attending conferences will also allow visibility. You can even meet your potential employers or in my case, potential clients. So conferences is a huge deal in my opinion to get yourself uh, um, exposed to what's happening in the industry itself. So societies. 
Nice. Um, and bonus for networking, you can find Rajay on Instagram. She is Rajay29, and you can find her on LinkedIn. I think if I do that, there, if you type in Rajay Thea Garajan, oh man, I, did I butcher that? I, yeah, we were so practicing. I swear we were practicing <laughs> before this live stream. But if you look her up her name on LinkedIn, you will definitely find her and you should network with her as well. So to wrap this up, Rajay, let's talk some industry insights. Um, I want to thank our audience for joining us. And as we wrap this up, I invite you to go to the comments section and leave a comment if you have any last minute questions for Rajay about the oil and gas industry or about what it means to be an offshore field engineer, how to get started, how to level up while you're typing in your questions or comments. Rajay, do you have any last minute words of advice for us, any industry insights that you'd like to share? I think for um, especially students who is looking into embarking yourself into the oil and gas industry, um, we are often always uh, focused on to securing a job in huge companies, mm -hmm. um, you know, getting ourselves into operator companies that's very you know popular, well known, or in fact even services companies that are huge. But then again, penetrating into the oil and gas industry is already a big deal. So in my opinion, I would say you don't have to. There's no such thing as you know, big company being good and growing company means that the you know you're not going to grow because at the end of the work and your career progression. And just because you're in a big company doesn't mean that they're going to value your growth um, because oftentimes big companies have bigger things to deal and it's just you're going to be very limited now nothing not to be biased or what this is something to be prepared for because sometimes um even growing companies is going to have you're going to be open to more opportunities to learn so i would say don't be um you know uh, strict with where you're going towards when you're getting yourself into the industry be open to any uh sort of path because once you get just you get your foot into the door like once you get yourself into the industry it's about gaining your experience building your profile up and then finding a way to settle in the industry and just learning through like i said you acquire your skills through experience and just getting yourself in there is what's great and just selling yourself as you grow because there's always going to be a starting point to, you know, growing. I think that is absolutely solid, solid advice. Love it. And Rajay, I want to thank you so much for joining us and telling us all about the oil and gas industry and what it means to be an offshore field engineer, uh, industry explorers. Thank you guys. If you want to follow Rajay, she is on Instagram at Rajay29. She is also on LinkedIn and Guys, thank you so much for tuning in. This was a pleasure and be sure to subscribe to you subscribe to Industry Explorers on YouTube. Until next time, explorers, I will see you on our next adventure. Take care. <laughs>